welcome to episode 200 of the Postal Hub podcast. I'm Ian Kerr. First up, Marek Rzecki from Last Mile Experts and my co-host for the Last Mile Profits video series joins me to talk about how city centres are transforming post-COVID and what this means for the last mile. Then James Hale from the UPU shares some examples of how posts are delivering social services during the pandemic. Joining me on the line is Marek Krzyzewski from Last Mile Experts. Marek, we've been doing what I think is an interesting, interesting series of videos over the past couple of months, posting them on LinkedIn under, under the banner, The Last Mile Profits. The videos are available on LinkedIn and on YouTube, but we really want people to get involved, don't we? Absolutely, because I think that the material we do is only as good as the input we have, the comments and the questions. And we've been getting some quite staggering feedback from some people as well. Ian, if everybody was as active as the cargo bike lobby, I've called we, them the we cargo have some bike really lobby. exciting material. I've called them the cargo bike lobby, and I'm never going to live that down, I fear. Um, <laughs> um, but we had a very interesting discussion about cargo bikes and their applicability and appropriateness in the last month. Actually, I just want to go into that before we, we move on to other things. We just wanted to promote the, pod, the, the videos, but... I actually want to talk about this. We are seeing a growing number of cities in Europe as they emerge from lockdown, closing off streets or closing off lanes to traffic. I think this is going to have a tremendous impact on the last mile, whether you're a postal operator, a courier, or whatever it is. What do you reckon, Mark? Do you, what do you think is going to come out of this and how are posts and parcel operators are going to do they have to transfer a form somehow? Do they have to change their operations to deal with all these bike lanes that are out there and these pedestrian-only zones? Well, absolutely. And, and if it's like the Polish scenario, and I think it is in many places, uh, electric vehicles can use those bus lanes. So the limitations do not extend to most electric vehicles. And I think that's an important point, so that will have influence. But the second thing, and you know what I'm going to say, tell me, and what am I going to talk about? Something about out-of-home delivery, I assume. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> the, the reality is if you want to deal with it and if you, if you want to maintain capacity, it's all about out-of-home. And if you have any doubt, ask the Chinese who know a thing or two about that. And I, I do think that there will be more out-of-home delivery if the local councils, the city, what do you call them, you know, the, the, the city, the city positive, hall, yeah. That if they say, or the basically whatever administering the roads and all that, if they say, well, you know what, the, the Milan City Council says we're going to have our own set of parcel lockers. We're not just going to shut down the lanes. We're going to put in our own parcel lockers, and they're going to be carrier agnostic. I can see that as being something that could start happening across Europe. That so that could be a, a, an impetus for your favourite topic: carrier agnostic parcel lockers. And, and I think, Ian, it is going to come. It's going to take some time. It will be the most forward-sighted local authorities. We know Transport for London for a while has been doing a lot of work in this space. Um, and, you know, let's see where it takes us. The, the thing that is absolutely clear, post-COVID, the e-commerce boom is going to be even bigger. And we cannot maintain capacity operating the way we are. The ecological issues are secondary but it's part of the same picture it is it is there's, exactly. there's there's capacity there's technology behind things as well um and i know i've been ranting a bit lately about um postal operators not you know giving customers the most customer centric options when it comes to receiving their their deliveries but there is an environmental aspect to this as well and we've discussed this on our videos for the last mile profits about the comparative emissions for lockers versus versus home delivery um, and all those sorts of things and there's all these knock on effects for things like traffic congestion um, I, I just i do think that there that we are at a point where the, the what local authorities are doing in terms of their roads loading zones access into green zones things like that will have a, a profound impact on the last mile in those areas. And it doesn't mean that you should just plough all of your money and in investing in cargo bike manufacturers, by the way, everybody. In our, in our last video, we asked about having union members and leaders send their comments. I would love to hear from local authorities or smart cities who've done something interesting. 
because, um, you know, they're the guys on the front line. And it would be really cool to understand, you know, what are they thinking? Where are they going? Where do they think they might yeah, need? Because I've perceived some of these local authorities as just having a war on, on white vans. I know that sounds like an odd thing to say, but, for example, I've seen the messaging put out by some councils in an effort to seem you know, environmentally sensitive, perhaps they're saying, well, we have to cut down on the number of vans in our city centres. Okay, that's great, but how are you going to get the goods to those businesses that need the stock, for example? Or how are you going to deliver the parcels to people who live in the cities? So there has to be this, this whole sort of thinking about how, the, our, how our beautiful white vans <laughs> fit into the, the equation. Um, and we're just talking about the last mile here, everybody. I mean, if you talk to anybody involved in heavy haulage and transport and construction, they'll give you some very colourful opinions on how trucks get access to city centres and building sites. But that's another story altogether. You know what, though? The concept, Ian, is the same. It's about seeking to rationalise, standardise, share resources rather than everybody doing their own thing. So I think a lot of the the, the views at the moment that are presented by some, some of these smart cities make a lot of sense. The, the, what would be really great, though, is to have some examples. We could discuss them. Yeah. I'd love to hear from smart cities people. Um, you know, contact me, Ian, at thepostalhub.com. Leave a message on LinkedIn or on YouTube or wherever you find us and um, let us know what you think because the, there are levers being pushed at the moment in, in cities um, that will have profound implications for the last mile. Anyway, getting back to the original point of this discussion, please watch our videos. Uh, <laughs> Please watch our videos. You can find us on LinkedIn. Just search for Last Mile Profits on LinkedIn. You can also find us on YouTube. Um, I'll put a link in the in the newsletter I send out and on thepostalhub.com so you can find the videos there one way or another. Marek. And I think what's important is, you know, by asking us questions, watching the videos, liking it if you like it, then you're helping us continue. We do this pro bono. So it would be really great to get as much input as possible from you. And if you're a, an industry supplier and you want to sponsor the videos, you can. Drop me a line. Ian it'll at be the, less pro bono even. I like that. Ian at thepostalhub.com is my email address. Mata Krzyzewski from Last Mile Experts and the Last Mile Profits. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, everyone. Joining me on the line is James Hale. James is managing the Postal Social Services Project at the UPU. James, welcome. We're going to get stuck into a whole load of non-parcel related stuff that's happening in the postal world, in particular uh, services that the posts are providing that have really come to light, not come to light, come to the fore since the pandemic has hit. James, uh, can you just give us a bit of a background before we get into some examples of what's happening on the ground in various postal operators around the world? What's been happening? Because this is something that you and the team at the UPU have been working on for not just since the pandemic hit, but even last year. Just fill us in on what's been happening there. So for the last, well, for for actually quite a few years, the the UPU has been involved in uh, developing uh, a series of sustainable development projects and initiatives And historically, we've really focused on environmental sustainability. So there's obviously a huge push to reduce the carbon emissions associated with with delivery of mail and all the and everything that goes on with you know involving logistics and delivery networks. But as well as the environmental sustainability sustainability aspect, we are very keen to um, help posts deliver a lot of goals related to human well-being. So really, it's it's this kind of two two aspects to our work: the environmental and the social. And so, uh, in 2019, we started to develop some projects with some of our partners. We asked ourselves the question: What could we do to support posts um, who want to diversify? Which is obviously really important. At, um, I think uh, you know, so in terms of improving uh, the resilience of postal businesses, but also tr- trying to offer social services. And so by that, we mean uh, services around education and health and community well-being. Um, And these are things, obviously, people, there's a demand for those services from the public, but also 
Uh, many national governments have policies that uh, they struggle to implement, let's say, uh, related to um, education uh, and health. Um, and posts are often very well placed to help them implement those policies. And we just mentioned an interesting thing there, which is about the way that not basically not every post is the same. That whilst we think about the post just as a, we could think about the post as an organisation that handles letters and now handles letters and parcels, but there is the, these gigantic post office networks attached to or part of the posts, and the services that are offered there are, are they can vary quite differently depending in part upon the mission of the post, on the um, legislative background to the post and the ownership of the post and then, as you've just said, the government's own uh, goals, shall we say, in terms of delivering services, delivering social services and so on and so forth. How did you go out and find out what was happening out there in the different, in the different postal operators around the world? We've actually got um, funding from the Japanese government to look at this. So, so we had uh, funding for a year. Um, and the project was uh, divided into, uh, I suppose, um, a uh, first section was really, to, as you say, try and find out what's going on. Then we, from, from, from this kind of uh, desk study and questionnaires that we developed, uh, the aim was then to use that to, to develop an analysis and producing best practice guidance, and ultimately to start rolling out a series of pilot projects. And so the the initial the initial work uh, involved a a questionnaire which we sent out to all our members and we got a very high response rate so that in itself suggests that this is something that posts are very interested in and we, we asked them some very basic questions because there is no there's really no there's not lots of data out there so people have highlighted in the past all the different impos- uh, positive things that posts are doing for for you know communities but but this was really the first time that there was going to we were going to start to get an overview of what was going on and we had a very high response rate as well so uh, we had uh, 108 posts replying, which is very high. And out of those, 79% said they already offer some sort of uh, public or social service, um, in addition to their core business of, you know, obviously, um, the mail deliveries. Uh, so, so how do how do you define a, a social service though? Is it just the fact that you have a post office in a community that otherwise might not have? any any sort of retail business or is it more than that is it offering something that's somehow classified as a social service was dealing with the elderly or offering government services over the counter or something like that how do you define it we had to be quite careful with that because what we didn't want was as you say um people just using examples of how how the presence of the post has, has helped the community i mean that's i think that's very clear and that there's quite a bit of research to show that you know that um simply having Mail carriers on the street is, uh, you know, has a positive effect on, you know, neighbourhood, um, there's people's sense of safety, for example, or that having, uh, you know, have people having access to postal deliveries is, you know, is, is obviously it has these economic effects which have spillover effects on, on people. So, so we, that, I think that's well known and accepted. What we wanted to do is go beyond that and really start to say, okay, how is the post? Uh, expanding its scope, I suppose, in different countries fr- from this from this core business to things like uh, providing educa- educational services. So there's quite a lot of uh, different examples we've got. We've got, I think, just over 100 examples that were sent in of the different things. I mean, in Switzerland, where I'm based now, the Post operates a bus service, for example. Um, that's quite unusual. Um, but posts are often involved in awareness campaigns about all sorts of um, you know, socially important subjects, delivering medicines, blood donation in post offices, and the, the list goes on and on. And and that's, I suppose, one of the benefits of doing this is until we ask, we don't really have a sense of what the posts do. So we didn't give too many categories. With the pandemic hitting early this year, h- how did that change what you were doing or did it sort of refocus what you were doing? Around about March, we realised that uh, we started to, we're looking at various social media feeds. We started to see that uh, quite a few posts were reacting to this quickly. Essentially, you've got a situation where most of the businesses within some of these countries have effectively stopped operating, or they, you know, or they've they've certainly reduced their activity. So you've got the emergency services, and then really you've got the post that is an, uh, providing an opportunity uh, for people to access. Services. I mean, it's 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 quite strong. It's quite 
it's quite clear that that a lot of the services that were being offered as maybe you know fringe services or to a relatively small cr- group of people community were now in demand uh, by a much larger group of people so pretty quickly we realized that this was you know we had to respond to this and what we decided to do was was pause our main project We'd already got a sense of all the different services that Post were already offering in, in terms of social um, sustainability, let's say. Or so we then decided, well, let's try and gather all these examples. Let's let's um, talk to our members. Uh, let's look at keep keep uh, you know searching on the various um, news feeds that we have access to, and provide like a central location where we can gather all this information. Um, not being too judgmental, not necessarily saying it's best practice, but saying, look, here is what's happening. As, as a resource, that is obviously very useful to the to uh, our members because they can actually say, okay, maybe they wanted to introduce a home checking service, for example, for seniors. By clicking on the exa- the examples that we've got, but you know we include the links to various articles, they can see that, okay, two or three other posts are operate are offering this, and maybe we can learn from them, and we don't have to start from scratch effectively. So what are some of the examples that you've seen um, coming out of this that, that through your monitoring of what other posts are doing and the sharing, what, what are some of the things that various posts are doing that's, that's different when it comes to providing social services or, or how they've become essential services during the pandemic? So a really good example uh, would be the home checking services that um, have been offered for quite a while in places like Japan and France. So you, 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 have, a, you have a system where the, uh, because in many countries, uh, the mail carrier is going to, ev- to people's front door, then that's a great opportunity to provide them with other services. And you have a lot of elderly people in some countries who are isolated from their relatives. Just this is before the pandemic, you know, this is just a, a demographic um, reality. So posts have been looking at that as an opportunity to provide a public service, but also to generate revenue. And that's something that's quite common, for example, in Japan. What we're, we're seeing is that services like that, are st- uh, other operators are starting to look at these services and, and implement them. So um, this is something that happened in Ireland. We, we actually created a series of uh, uh, what we call technical commentaries, which are effectively case studies uh, on different operators um, and we focused so far on Ireland, France, and Australia. And the first article was about was about uh, Unpost in Ireland because they were very quick off the mark, and they worked apparently night and day to to try and implement some of these services and quite a variety. So home checking of the elderly is is one where you can you can register yourself or, or a relative just to have a, a mail carrier knock on your door and check you're okay. That's people peace of mind. But obviously, in the context of COVID, that suddenly becomes critical because you have a lot of old people maybe living alone. Um, you can't check on them yourself if you're a relative. So, so suddenly that becomes quite an important surface for people's health and well-being is, is if mail carriers can do that. And they can also ask, you know, do you need any medicines delivered or do you need any, do you need, do you, you know, do you need some food deliveries? So the mail carriers you know their their role which maybe has, has been a historically the post often played that role in, in informally checking on people that's become formalized and in the context of the pandemic you know it's it's there's there's no one else out there really doing that so it's kind of raised the profile of these services the check on neighbor or check on the elderly service is something as you mentioned that uh la poste in france has been doing jersey post actually had to suspend theirs, if I recall correctly, because of social distancing uh, norms. Uh, but anyway, returning to La Poste, the, there's, uh, so are there other things that La Poste has been doing apart from this uh, you know, check on an, a relative or check on an elderly person service? If you recall, we, we have these kind of broad cap- categories looking at health, education, uh, well-being. And we decided to focus on uh, La Poste because of the educational services that they've introduced. Now, obviously, Many people are aware, many people sitting at home are aware that, 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 that as well as having to work from home, you know, a lot of schools are closed. So a lot of children at home and the response from schools and education ministries has tended to be, well, you can keep working at home you keep doing your homework, just go online. You know, your lectures or your, your classes will be given virtually and you can download the documents, which is all fine and good. But 
there's still quite a lot of people that don't have a computer in the family, or if they do, they don't necessarily have uh, internet access. So in France, that was identified as a particular issue that, uh, you know, even again, before before the pandemic, there were there were families who, who couldn't get online to access educational materials for their children and, you know, the children being assigned homework online. So this is a, this was already identified as an issue. So they'd already started to develop some projects, um, two projects. One was simply uh, the post uh, was involved in distributing unused school equipment, school computer equipment to uh, families in need. And the second example is slightly more complicated, but it, essentially what happens is it's a it's called homework at home, and it's uh, the the schools uh, set email la poste the homework. And then postal staff print out the homework and post it. I thought you were going to say the postal staff print out the homework and then complete it, in which case it sounds like a great service. <laughs> yes, I'd definitely apply for that. But it's, uh, it's I mean, it's, it sounds slightly convoluted, but but I, I can't actually think of an alternative really. You know, if there's there's people that, there's pupils that are, that are being asked to, to download their homework and they can't do it and they can't print it out and et cetera. Um, so the, the post is stepping in and providing that service, and then they re- they return it to you know the, these um, centres within the post by mail using a free envelope, and then the postal staff scan those documents and email them back to the schools. So it's a kind of a hybrid between you know there's the kind of digital aspect between the posts and the schools, and then there's the kind of more traditional way of uh, uh, you know so I don't know if it's analog, but certainly. It's a more traditional way of completing your homework, you know, from on the other side of things. So it's, it was, I think that's a really nice example. In the next couple of days, we're going to publish a, a, comment, a technical commentary, which is really a, a case study and a, an analysis that's, that tries to understand how on earth can you put in place a, a new service so quickly in response to uh, the pandemic. Because it's typically these projects, you know, roll out over, over maybe six or seven months. And now some of the, um, the staff are being asked to put these things in place immediately. Um, so that was, so, so that's the kind of question we're actually asking. We're, we're, we're phoning up and having interviews with various um, project you know, managers um, to try and ask how they do that. And generally the, the answer is that, you know, they're working very hard. Um, they're, they're working weekends uh, they're delegating responsibility a little bit more, so you know there's 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 less a bit less bureaucracy. So it, so it's been interesting to see that actually how these things you know we, we caught the first article I think it's called behind the scenes down post, and it's really to try and understand not just what they're doing but how they manage to do that so quickly. Well, this is a key point though because posts have a reputation, a well earned reputation in my experience, of being slow to move when it comes to bringing out new products or new services. So, you know, in some respects, the urgency of the pandemic and the need to find solutions and the post's unique position as being a national organisation, having a post office network, having the postal delivery network, puts them in that position. And, and they're often also deemed to be an essential service, so they're continuing to operate in some shape or form during all of this. They've been able to to learn how to really roll things out quickly. Um, it'll be interesting to see if other posts are able to learn from the examples that you've just mentioned, from Unpost or from La Post. Um, we've got a few more minutes. Just, uh, James, do you have another example there of something that's come across your desk or th- as part of the project that was uh, and is, has really piqued your interest? Another example would be from your home country, from Australia. Previously, I've had contact with several posts about what I would call experience providers, so in terms of social services. So we've probably got about 10 or 15 posts worldwide that have got a whole a whole series of, of different initiatives that they'd already put in place. And Australia was one of those posts that had quite a few uh, social uh, services already in place. So they were already, already on our radar. And then we noticed that there was a, an article that was talking about how in Australia, how the post had um, developed a pharmacy home delivery service. Now, when we have, there's, there's a series of questions that we ask, including things like, how is this resourced? You know, how did you organize the team to put this in place? But one of the questions we ask is, how, you know, how, who came up with the idea? And the, the actual initial idea came from the pharmacy 
Guild of Australia. So this was a body representing a lot of the pharmacies within Australia, and they were lobbying the government uh, to say, look, we want to you know, respond in some way. And then through that contract, uh, through that contact, the, the, uh, the Post then had a discussion um, with the government about how they could um, maybe ease some of the potential pressure on pharmacies, but also allow people to stay at home. So if you're ill or if you're vulnerable, the last thing you want to do is go to a pharmacy um, unless you have to, because obviously you know, it's, a, it's a location where you may encounter other people, particularly ill people. So they very rapidly, uh, within a couple of weeks, managed to put in place a home delivery service where people could get their prescription medicine delivered by the post to their front door. And you had to qualify, you had to be, um, t- I mean, there's a whole set of criteria, but essentially you had to be identified as being vulnerable. So, uh, so that based on your age or your, your medical history. But the Australian government put in place very quickly a funding package for that, meaning that uh, the pharmacies, when they, they, they used an, effectively an adapted express mail service to deliver these, these medicines, and then they could claim back the cost of that delivery from the government in a rebate. So it's quite simple, but it was rolled out very quickly. And it's something that may well be commercialized in the future because it's, it's obviously very convenient. A lot of people don't have the time or are not particularly interested in going to a pharmacy to collect their medicines. Um, so that's a nice example of how they introduced a, uh, a service in response to the pandemic. Um, very strong benefits for people, but also, you know, you can see how that helps governments direct, you know, it's part of the government response, but also it's helping people and it could be commercialised, you know, at a later stage. James, if anybody listening to this wants to find out more about either the project that you're uh, managing there at the UPU, some of the case studies that you've been looking into, or if they've even like to share something that they've been doing in their own country, um, is there information available on the UPU website? Absolutely. So um, you should be able to get to that web page uh, from the main landing page of the, um, the UPU website. We're really keen to hear about uh, case studies, what's basically just examples of what posts are doing. We have lists of examples for social services, uh, also for financial services. There's also a section on these technical commentary uh, articles, which are quite in-depth, really focus on a postal audience or a government audience. They're well worth a read. And if anyone wants to get in contact with us, we have on our webpage a dedicated email address for um, anyone uh, who wants to find out more about social and financial services. So I'll stick a link on the postalhub.com to the relevant part of the UPU website. We go straight to the UPU website and you should be able to dig it up through there. So lots of um, really interesting stuff that's really come to the fore. A lot of projects are already underway in some cases or projects have been developed very quickly at the posts as a result of the need to respond to communities during this pandemic. James Hale from the Postal Social Services Unit at the UPU, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Ian. Soon on the Postal Hub podcast, Bertrand Spate from Keezy Tracking on modern parcel tracking and the customer experience. You can subscribe to the podcast on a variety of podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. If you have an email address, put it to good use. Spruce up your email inbox with a weekly burst of Postal Hub goodness. Sign up for the Postal Hub e-newsletter. It's a weekly email update with the latest podcast and other news. Go to thepostalhub.com and sign up there. If you're on LinkedIn, send me an invitation to connect. I love to hear from podcast listeners. When you send that invitation to connect, include a note to say that you're a podcast listener, and that way I'll say yes to your invitation to connect straight away. If you want to contact me about anything at all, maybe you want to suggest a topic for a future episode of the podcast, email me direct at ian at thepostalhub.com. I'm Ian Kerr. Thanks for listening in, and I look forward to your company next time on the Postal Hub podcast. <laughs>